What's up guys, UFC on ESPN4 just wrapped up and it was a decent card. I mean, early on there's a lot of decisions. I think it broke the record for most consecutive decisions ever in a UFC card. But then it, it started going first round knockouts, I think three in a row. And then the last fight was a technical and masterful performance from Leon Edwards' decision win. And that's the one we're going to talk about first. Leon Edwards defeats RDA, Javier Dos Anjos, by decision, 150-45 and 249-46. He pretty much dominated the fight. I mean, the striking was too much, the length, the constant volume from the outside. It wasn't like the Tony Ferguson fight where Ferguson didn't allow RDA to really do anything because of his long reach and his volume with that. Edwards was a lot more precise. I mean, he was looking for his shots. You could see he was clearly focused and sharp the entire time. Never got distracted, never got complacent. Always saw the targets and fired at the correct time. So on Twitter said it perfectly. There was no fat to the movements of Leon Edwards. He didn't do anything extra. He didn't do anything too much, too little. Everything was so perfect. It was an amazing performance. And to be honest, even though some people say it wasn't the most exciting thing in the world, this kind of fight, this kind of performance actually gets me so pumped. I mean, the southpaw, one, two, three. I mean, there was a point in the fight where he threw a jab straight right hook. And when he threw the one, two, I thought he was going to do like he was doing for the first two rounds. And that was extend so far with the left hand he potentially was going to get countered. But when he followed up with the right hook, as RD actually tried to counter him, just that little moment that people aren't noticing could have saved him big. The technical awareness and positional awareness from Leon Edwards is something a lot of fighters do not have yet. I mean, we've seen James Vick earlier on. He could probably use a little bit of that, you know? But not even just the striking was so phenomenal. The early takedown really set pace of how the fight was going to go. He said it perfectly. His game plan was to take the early rounds from RDA through any means possible. And his path was through takedowns. Because I believe he's seen how RDA deals with wrestlers in this division. Because they're so much bigger than they were at 155. I mean, there was Khabib. But Khabib is a 155er with the strength of a 170 or you know so maybe went that route because of the wrestlers that he is facing in this division and he knows if you take the early rounds RDA has a hard time coming back from that he doesn't have that KO power he had at 155 he's a lot more volume based and he tears the bigger men down so he goes to the legs kicks your calves goes to the body with a left uppercut he works takedowns before going to the head he mixes up his target practicing but he cannot do such a thing on Leon Edwards without paying for it because of the reach and the range control I understand in my prediction video I said uh, Leon Edwards may have been the longest guy besides Tony Ferguson there was Neil Magny but I will say that Leon Edwards is probably the best with range management with distance management that anybody already has ever fought against before I would say probably a little bit better than Tony Ferguson because Ferguson does allow points to get in close on him and a similarity between those two is their elbows are like heat seeking. I mean, you just throw them and they're going to connect somehow. You can throw them across the cage and it'll somehow slash RDA open. Dominic Cruz kind of said it best. He didn't explain it completely, but I understand what he was saying. So Leon Edwards was controlling the range, right? He's staying on the outside. He was throwing a lot of punches RDA's way, uppercuts, jabs, one, two, one, two, threes, and waits for RDA to cover that distance because he kind of has to. He didn't have too much success with leg kicks. One of them actually did drop Leon Edwards, but most of them were missing. So he had to find his way in through the boxing and then eventually to the takedowns but whenever RDA went through stage one to get in on Leon Edwards which usually the boxing usually starts with a jab Edwards did either two things one he landed a heat seeking elbow or he ducked under and clinched up use his body weight use his strength against RDA and took him to the ground or just controlled him against the cage so it was a very hard battle for RDA to fight can't fight from the long range, and his pressure is getting negated. And even with wrestling, Leon Edwards actually out-wrestled RDA. I mean, when's the last time an Englishman, you know, uh, they have gotten some slack because of that. But Leon Edwards has shown Europeans can wrestle as well, especially Englishmen. Just a masterclass performance. I mean, even taking down RDA in the beginning like that shocked me. And as soon as it happened, my confidence for Leon Edwards to win this fight skyrocketed because of that. Because it gives RDA a lot more to think about. Not the outside boxing not the kicks, not that close range elbows, not the clinch, but now takedowns, it was too much information for RDA. So great performance from Leon Edwards, shoots him up the ranks, he's a legit contender now, he's not just a prospect, and who I'd like to see him fight next, he did call out Masvidal, but I don't think Masvidal is going to take that fight, and also I think Masvidal is closer to a title shot, so why would he? I think do Leon Edwards versus Tyron Woodley. I think it's a perfect fight. Or you could do Leon Edwards versus Santiago Ponzinibbio. That would be an excellent fight as well. Either of those fights are amazing. And as for RDA, I mean, this guy gets no easy fights. I like to see RDA versus Steven Thompson. That would be an excellent fight. A contrast of styles. Aggression versus elusiveness. Precision versus volume. And then the co-main event. 
Walt Harris knocks out Alexei Olenek in 12 seconds into the fight. I was looking at the comments of my prediction video. You know, I see the comments and people were really doubting my pick on this one. They were saying, why would I go with Walt Harris? Alexei Olenek's going to submit him easy. Walt Harris folds under pressure. He isn't the kind of guy I was describing. Man, I'm not going to lie. I did get kind of excited when he won. To do it that quick, I didn't expect that quickly, but I definitely expect Walt Harris to have a massive advantage on the feet and takedown defense is so strong. Alexei Olenek is not known for really good takedowns, so it was a tough fight for Olenek. I mean, pretty much everything he does gets deflected or countered. A stylistically very tough fight for him. And I kind of felt bad for Olenek because I really like the guy. He's such a nice, a humble fighter. When he got clipped by that left hand after the flying knee to the body and his ankle rolled or sprained or what happened to it i mean that was pretty nasty and walt harris from his last fight that's what i was describing look at his last fight alone forget the fights before that he showed an improvement and a change in his style that made people think who is the weasel talking about when he's describing walt harris and the fact that he is improving to be a legit contender in this division like that I am super excited for Walt Harris. The biggest thing to knock on him before was he didn't know when to pull the trigger. He didn't know when to go forward. He didn't know when to let his hands go. Now he knows. Now he's finding a lot more opportunities in himself and a lot more options with his range and attacks that he's probably never seen before. And that can open up an entire new world of possibilities. So great win for Walt Harris. And who I'd like to see him fight next. So he beat the number nine, Alexei Olenek. If Cain Velasquez comes back, I'd like to see that fight. If not him, Alistair Overeem is good. Or Shamil Abdurahimov. But personally, I like to see him fight maybe an Alistair Overeem where Walt Harris has the power. He has a speed in his hands. He's long. He's hard to take down. It's going to be mostly a striking match, I believe. And it competes with the technical savviness of Alistair Overeem. It could probably teach Walt Harris a lot of things too out there. And as for Alexei Olenek, he's probably going to take some time off. I mean, it looked like he injured his ankle and it was a bad knockout. When he comes back, I would like to see him maybe fight Augusto Sakai or some other low-ranked opponent. Martin Tuboro would be excellent as well, not as dangerous as someone like Walt Harris, and definitely a doable fight for him to get it to the ground. So then we go to Greg Hardy, knocking out Juan Adams 45 seconds into the first round. Now, like all Greg Hardy fights, they're all weird. They all end with questions. Two big heavyweights, giant heavyweights that cut to 265, go at each other. They're throwing jabs a lot, and Juan Adams is getting the better of them. You can see Hardy's head snapping back, and the biggest thing I took away from it is you can tell Greg Hardy's not composed with striking yet. When he's under fire, you could see he's kind of scrambled, you know? His sensors and his radar is just all just all out of whack whenever a punch is getting thrown at him. When I see his arms flailing and he's kind of switching his feet backwards, like walking backwards really, really quickly, almost stutter stepping backwards. I mean, it's just a clear look that he still needs more mat time. And obviously he does. He's very green. He only has six fights professionally. But sparring, longer fights would do him very, very well. He has the athleticism. He has the power. And we saw that in this fight. It's still strange how he did it. I mean, first of all, you have to give some credit to Greg Hardy's takedown defense. He stopped that takedown with a strong wizard. And I didn't think he would be able to do that, especially against Juan Adams, who has taken down opponents before. And he's a huge guy. I mean, Juan Adams is enormous, right? Greg Hardy, wizard, and just started throwing arm punches with no real leverage and no real power behind it besides how much he can generate with the movement of his arm hitting Juan Adams' head. And he TKO'd him. I mean, maybe Greg Hardy has his otherworldly power we have never seen before. They can knock people out like that. But people who are saying that Juan Adams was fine, they shouldn't have stopped the fight. Here's the thing. The ref gave Juan Adams so many signals. And these signals were yelling at him to do something. And Adams sat there sat on the single leg and just took the shots for like 10 seconds. A lot of unanswered shots. I don't know if they were the back of the head. I mean, the hair of Adams really makes it hard to see where they were landing. And even for the ref, I mean, not just for the viewers. I bet for the ref, he doesn't probably know if they're landing in the back of the head. Yeah, if the ref is signaling you to move, to do something, that always means, he tells you backstage, that always means he's getting ready to stop the fight. Adams sat there and took the loss. It's a clear win for Greg Hardy, in my opinion. Adams didn't respond that well. Didn't look like he was out of it or anything like that. Probably hurt because he did actually, I think, for a slight period of time, went for that single leg on Dan Mergliata. And that is never a good sign. Solid win for Greg Hardy. People were saying that they should throw him to the top-ranked guys. He, you know, he's full of himself, all this stuff. I understand, but you have to also see it from his perspective that he's very confident in his skills, right? He wants to be the best in the world. People don't get into this unless they have some huge goal. They're reaching for the stars, you know, and they're going to think very highly of themselves. You know, when Greg Hardy says he's going to be the next greatest of all time and stuff like that, I don't think about it too much because everybody should be thinking like that in this sport. And people saying that he should get thrown to Derek Lewis. I mean, I understand why people are saying it. It's 
It's, I mean, just stop. That would be not right. That shouldn't get sanctioned at all. Not yet. I understand people have disdain for Greg Hardy for things he's done outside of the sport, but you have to give him credit. He fought a guy with very similar experience to him. Juan Adams only has seven fights professionally. I think he has three or four fights amateur. Greg Hardy has six fights professionally. I think he has three fights amateur. So they're very similar in experience. And he beat the guy. You got to give Greg Hardy credit for that. 45 seconds only too. I'm very curious to see how he's going to do later on in his career. And people thinking that he's going to get thrown to the rank guys soon. I highly doubt it, man. I think it's going to be another year of him just building up his record, building up his knockout highlight reel, facing guys with similar experience, but that's still a challenge. He's still fighting guys, potentially should give him a hard time, and they're not. I have no idea who should be fighting next, but it should be someone with a similar experience level. And same for Juan Adams. And then we go to Dan Hooker putting out the fire on James Vick. I mean, that left hook he landed on Vick was the equivalent of the entire beating that he took from Edson Barbosa. All of that agony, all of that pain into one punch puts Vic out, man. That was such a beautiful knockout. I, I can't get over that one. I'm going to watch it a few times. I might watch it a dozen times. I love that combo he set up on him. Faked the right hand, came in orthodox, faked it, got Vic to gallop backwards. I think it was a gallop. I have to watch it again. And threw a jab and pulled down his right hand when he threw the jab, which is a huge mistake. And Hooker tricked Vic with the right hand, Switch got his head on the outside while he's in southpaw now and followed the entire momentum with the left hook of his lifetime. I can't get enough of that. And James Vick, I don't know, man. The fundamentals are just not there. The positioning is just not there. He pulled his hand down from guarding himself. Ah, oh, man. And from a guy who said that his background is boxing, he won two Golden Glove titles. And I believe his amateur record was 17-3 in boxing. I don't know if he went professional. On that kind of level, man, to have the fundamental flaws in boxing, I mean, his own background is where he's getting caught. His jiu-jitsu is good. His wrestling's decent. His kicks are okay. But it's his boxing that's kind of getting him in trouble, which tells a lot about the sport, man. I mean, Dan Hooker is not a boxer, and he outboxed James Vick. Dan Hooker was in trouble early on in the fight, and you saw the same thing, kind of similar to the Justin Gaethje fight, and also the Francisco Trinaldo fight, which people probably have missed. James Vick scaling the cage and moving out, and almost gets clipped. I mean, because he doesn't bring his hands up, and he doesn't move his head at all. He's almost like an open target for a lot of guys. I mean, imagine a Conor McGregor or someone who has a precision like that. I mean, that stuff shouldn't even get sanctioned how bad it is. If only the commissions knew how technically flawed that is and how dangerous it can be. But amazing performance for Dan Hooker. He needed a win like this. Going from the beating that he took from Edson Barboza, not only showed his physical toughness, he has shown he is one of the toughest guys I have ever seen in my entire life. Watching on TV, in person, heard their voice, sensed them somehow. I mean, Dan Hooker is one of the toughest guys physically I have ever witnessed in my entire life. But not only that mental toughness, to come back from that kind of beating, get humiliated after calling out Barboza, getting shamed in his own game, and coming out here better than ever, looking to prove something. I mean, Dan Hooker is a force to be reckoned with in the future. If he's going to be able to get better from that, there's nothing that's going to stop his growth. The way he got finished by Edson Barboza is worse than getting knocked out like James Vick did. It's way worse. It's way more humiliating. Getting body shot like crazy and falling. It's almost like, like Pat Berry says, you know, when you fall to a body shot, you give up. I don't, I don't think necessarily, but, you know, that's what a lot of people think. And maybe even Dan Hooker believes that too, so... I'm so high on Dan Hooker right now. Uh, so who would like to see him fight next? So he beat the number 15, James Vick. He should be a number 15 fighter now. I do not want to see him fight Islam Akashev or Alexander Hernandez or Gregor Gillespie because those guys are up and coming and so is Dan Hooker. I don't want to see him fight each other yet, but they're all right there next to each other. Uh, maybe Charles Oliveira would be a good fight. Personally, a fight I want to see is him versus Paul Felder. That's an exciting fight that will wake me up right away. And as for James Vick, he should go to 170. He's too big. He's too tall. He's cutting too much weight. His chin can't take it. He has to go up. And who I'd like to see him fight up there? Maybe on Neil Magny. I understand Neil Magny is ranked, but it's actually a competitive fight. You know, Neil Magny is not this murderous puncher that's going to put James Vick into next week. And stylistically, it's a very competitive fight. You know, both long fighters, similar boxers. Neil Magny's decent with offensive wrestling. James Vick has a good BJJ game. They're both kind of similar with kicks and stuff like that. So, stylistically, I like to see him fight Neil Magny. And then we go to Alexander Hernandez, defeats Francisco Trinaldo, 230-27 to 129-28. Now, a lot of people are saying this is a robbery. I don't think it's a robbery. Like, I don't think Trinaldo absolutely won. And there's no way to turn that argument around. No, I think either could have won this fight. To be honest, I did miss most of the first round. I also did miss Arlovsky versus Ben Rothwell fight. You know, I caught onto the card. 
second round into this. Pretty uneventful, to be honest. Both are looking to counter each other. Trinaldo's doing the Anderson Silva thing where no one's leading the fight and he's kind of taunting Hernandez. But Trinaldo should try to probably do something as well. I understand Hernandez is known to be a little bit aggressive and that's probably what Trinaldo was thinking. That's probably what his game plan was. And he was sticking to it, waiting for Hernandez eventually. But it never really happened. And it threw this fight all out of whack. Hernandez, I understand learning from his past fight he can't be uber aggressive and get caught so he tried to point fight this time try to use his speed get in and out throw a lot of kicks and stuff like that i like to see him go for a little bit more takedowns maybe not trying to stay on the ground with ronaldo but threaten him and control him and stuff like that but nothing else to really say about this i mean the spinning kick from ronaldo cut up hernandez but it was kind of like an accident didn't seem extremely powerful or anything like that to put out hernandez or hurt him badly but one thing i will say i definitely did not see a 30 27 because i thought hernandez may have won the second it could have went to ronaldo and i thought definitely ronaldo won the third and hernandez winning every single round Round, I do not agree at all. And it was his hometown, you know, conspiracies, tinfoil hats, ask Eddie Bravo to look into it. And who I'd like to see Hernandez fight next? So he beat Ronaldo, who should be just outside of top 15. If there was a top 20, Ronaldo should be like number 17, 16. So it's a decent win. For Hernandez, I like to see him fight Charles Oliveira. I think it's an excellent fight. Dangerous fight for Hernandez. To be honest, I do favor Oliveira, but who else is he gonna fight? Some other non-ranked opponent? But he's in the top 15. He's going to have to put that rank to a test against someone. But it will test Hernandez. This division's hard, man. You, I mean, if you're going to 155, expect it to be tough. There's no easy outs on this one. And as for Trinaldo, maybe him versus Vink Pickle. I mean, Vince Pichel, I think it's how you pronounce it. That would be a decent fight between veterans, older guys in the division. And I did miss the rest of the fights. I heard the Olavsky and Rothwell fight. They were kind of like hooking each other for the most part. They got gassed up pretty quickly. But I did hear Olavsky did land a lot of right hands. And Rothwell had a hard time with the speed. Very similar to the first fight, I believe. So I hope you guys enjoyed the reaction. If you did, make sure you give it a thumbs up. If you enjoy my content, make sure to subscribe. My next video is going to be a breakdown of the fights this weekend. So be looking for that. And again, thank you guys so much for watching. And I'll see you in the next video.